My name is Jonathan Goforth. Welcome back. This is going to be part two of some vocabulary terms that you're probably going to see used on your real estate exam. So we're going to go through a whole bunch of these terms. The very last term I'm going to talk about, I'm also going to give you some advice. As a listing agent, when you go on a listing appointment after you pass your exam and you get licensed, that's going to save you a lot of grief. It's going to probably save you some money. And so we're going to talk about that at the very end. So stick with me to the end on this one. Um, to keep real estate commissions happy, I have to say I am a licensed realtor in Kansas and Missouri, and I have my broker's license in Missouri. I'm with Keller Williams Platinum Partners, and that makes Kansas and Missouri real estate commissions happy. Um, I've been a realtor for 25 years. The last three years, I'm honored to have been listed in Forbes magazine as one of the top market leaders in the country. So for right now, as we get started, if you would give this video a like, uh, it just makes me feel good. <laughs> but number two, subscribe, because that's for you. My other videos are about how to make a lot of money in real estate. So after you get licensed and your career begins, you're going to want to know what to do. So for example, I've got a video coming up next month, how to get listings, how to get buyers. So you're going to want to click the bell icon next to subscribe because um, that's all how to make a lot of money in real estate, all kinds of real estate training videos. So number three on there, check out my other videos in the description of this. I've got a few other videos to help you pass the exam. Test questions, um, the practice questions, I've got national questions and some other vocabulary. So I'm going to make it easy. I'm going to put links to each of those in the description of this. And then after your license, come back and check out all my other videos on how to make a lot of money as a real estate agent. All right, let's jump right in. An acceleration clause. This is one of these terms that you're going to need to know. All the different vocabulary on this video, just like on part one, have come from uh, people who have recently took the exam are saying these are terms that they've seen on the exam. And so that's why these, I've handpicked these terms, so you're not just learning 10,000 vocabulary words. Let's start with acceleration clause. What is it? An acceleration clause is a contract provision within loan documents that allows a lender the ability to force a buyer to pay all of an outstanding loan if the borrower violates the agreed terms, breaching the loan contract or misses loan payments. So basically, the acceleration clause, it's not in the real estate contract, it's in the loan documents. So when you see acceleration clause, think of the loan. And that's what gives the lender the right to begin uh, foreclosure and demand that they pay the loan off immediately. That is the acceleration clause. It accelerates the uh, termination of the loan. So that's what I want you to link with acceleration clause is the lender. Next is debt. What is debt? It's something that is owed or due or promised. And just memorize that. That's what debt is. Something that is owed or due or promised. So let's talk about license. This is different than a real estate license. It has nothing to do with real estate license. This is a real estate term you just need to memorize. So when it comes to license, the owner can give permission. And that's the term I want you to remember. Permission. It's all this is. The owner can give permission instead of giving the right or giving an easement to cross his property in case he wants to stop it later. This is giving a license and it gives permission and it can be revoked. For example, an owner can give someone permission to camp on that owner's property. That would be called a license. It's something that would be uh, compared to an, giving an easement that would be permanent, that would give someone the ability to come onto 
your land permanently forever, an ongoing easement situation. This is something that's typically short term. And that's the difference between simply a license is just giving permission. A deed. What is a deed? A deed is a legal document that transfers property ownership from a seller, which is the grantor, to a buyer, the grantee. The key thing to remember about a deed, it is a legal document and it transfers property ownership from the seller to the buyer. So these next two are gonna to go together. So we're gonna talk about this just for a little bit. Land, these are basic terms, but we're, I'm starting off with land because I'm gonna build up to a pertinence. So land is a spot on the earth that goes down to the center and up to infinity. You might see that as uh, you think that's an easy question. Well, it's easy if you know it. <laughs> Again, land is a spot on the earth that goes down to the center and up to infinity. Now, real estate, that is a term that is going to be used in a variety of different questions. So what is real estate? In this case, it's land plus the appurtenances. So you got land plus the appurtenances. And you're probably just wondering, gosh, what is an appurtenance? I hope he says what that is. Well, yes. An appurtenance. This is something you're going to need to memorize. So let's talk about this for a second because chances are very likely you're going to see the word appurtenance used on your real estate exam. An appurtenance is a right or a privilege or an improvement permanently attached to the land. It runs with the land. It's there. It's permanent to the land. For example, we've got some examples of categories here. Different kinds of appurtenances. You'd have a natural appurtenance, which are streams, creeks, trees, and bushes. All those stay with the land. Man-made appurtenances would be the house or buildings on top of the land. Uh, you can have mineral rights, oil, and natural gas are two examples. You can have air rights and water rights. They are part of the real estate. So again, here's that slide from just before. Let's look at that again. Real estate equals the land plus the appurtenances. And now again... Memorize this, screenshot it, an appurtenance is a right, a privilege, or an improvement permanently attached to the land. It runs with the land. Easements are great appurtenances. They give people a right to do something with that land. An adjustable rate mortgage. I'm sure you've heard this. We haven't seen them too much over the past three or four years because uh, interest rates, the 30-year fixed, uh, have been so low, pretty much near record lows for the last couple of years. And so we haven't really seen this. So if you are kind of new to real estate, you may not be that familiar with an ARM. A-R-M stands for Adjustable Rate Mortgage. So this type of loan has a lower than normal interest rate locked in for a period of time at the beginning of the loan. That period of time is typically three years, five years, or 10 years. After that locked-in period is over, the rate can adjust higher based on a prearranged schedule and formula. This type of loan has a flexible interest rate. So it's in the title. It's an adjustable rate mortgage. That's the big thing to remember if you get a test question. The bottom sentence there, this type of loan has a flexible interest rate. And we're starting to see these again. Uh, now, you know, getting about halfway through 2022, interest rates are climbing. And so now you're going to see lenders start introducing more arms. And that's to get a lower interest rate up front. And this can be attractive. You know, after you get into real estate and you got buyers, if you know that buyer 
is, is gonna be transferred or only keep that house less than five years, then a five-year arm is attractive to them. They'll have a lower rate. They're gonna sell the house before the arm expires. Um, so adjustable rates have a good purpose to them. And it can also be a little scary <laughs> when the rates, when the rate lock runs out, if that's a five-year arm, you don't want to be in there year six, probably want to look at refinancing. So that is an arm. Capital gain. Capital gain, this is a term you hear a lot when people sell uh, investment properties or it's a married couple and they're selling their house and it's over $500,000 or they've lived in the house less than two of the last five years. All those things uh, would require them to have to pay capital gains tax. So what is capital gain? Capital gain is the profit from the sale of a property or an investment property. That's the profit. So you take a look at what they're selling it for, what did they pay for it uh, when they first bought it, and you look at determining what the profit was on that sale. That is the capital gain. This question is actually a repeat from uh, one that I did in part one. And the reason why it's on here, again, is because somebody made a comment that they recently took the real estate exam and they saw this question. So, and I figured they would. You're probably going to see it also. You're going to see this term used in some form of a question. So, the Federal National Mortgage Association... That stands for FNMA, and we say that as Fannie Mae. So Fannie Mae is that. When you hear the term Fannie Mae, well, what is Fannie Mae? Fannie Mae is the Federal National Mortgage Association. Now, what is it? This is the question. What is that? And here's what you need to memorize. Screenshot this so you can read it over and over until you get this memorized. This is a government-sponsored private corporation designed to assist the primary mortgage market. So the couple things in here you need to, to remember. It is a private company. You might get a question that uh, will say this is a government uh, company or this is the government or this is a division of the government. It's a government-run company with HUD. All these different kinds of things to trick you up because it looks like it would be. When you see the federal, national, that appears to be government. It is not. It's a private company. So, But it's government-sponsored. So the government sponsors this private corporation, which we call Fannie Mae. And its purpose is to assist the primary mortgage market. So what does that mean? So you have all these lenders out there and they're out there giving loans. Well, they run out of money quickly. And so Fannie Mae is this private company, it's government sponsored, and its purpose is to buy those loans. And it buys all kinds of loans from all lenders all around the country. And the purpose of that is to free up the liquidity of all those lenders. So those lenders can now do more loans. So all these lenders, they are constantly selling their loans to Fannie Mae. And that's the purpose of Fannie Mae. Memorize that. This is a good, good question. This is a good one to get you a, a point to pass this exam. And now we're going to do a question that I'm going to it's got two vocabulary words in it, and then I'm going to give you uh, free advice that will save you some grief as a listing agent after you get licensed in real estate. So I'm going to ask you two questions first. Can real estate ever become personal property? Or can personal property ever become real estate? And so this is going to be two vocabulary words. I want you to memorize these. And let's start with severance. I want to make sure you know severance. 
I think you might see severance used on your real estate exam. Severance is going from real estate to personal property. And so the answer to the, both those questions is yes. And so severance is going from real estate to personal property. Real property to personal property. For example, cutting down some trees and chopping them into firewood. That's taking real property with that real estate and turning it into personal property. Now a fixture. What is a fixture? This is going from personal property to real property. So an example of this would be you go to Home Depot, you go to Lowe's, you go to some hardware store and you buy a ceiling fan. When you go buy that ceiling fan, that is personal property. But when you install it in the bedroom and you've screwed it in, it's wired in, it is now a fixture and fixtures are real property. That has now become part of the real estate. And that is also a term you're gonna to wanna to know. Um, here is my free advice. <laughs> because I've been doing this 25 years, and you might be a new agent, about to become a new agent, here's what's gonna happen. After you become a realtor, and you are going to list a house. So this advice will be for listing agents. When you go through the house, you're gonna have probably in your state a seller's disclosure for your seller to fill out on that listing. There's gonna be a lot of questions on what stays, what doesn't stay. There might be a checklist asking, um, does the microwave stay? Does the oven stay? things like that, but there are certain things that you might get burned on during your career. So I want you to ask your clients certain things to see if they're gonna stay, if they're gonna leave. And I want you to get in the habit of walking through that house, your listing, and looking for these things. And when you do, write down some notes to remind yourself to ask about the refrigerator. Does it stay with the house or are they going to take it? Make sure they document it. Um, some other big ones, curtains and curtain rods. Now, typically people are gonna leave their blinds, but they don't always leave their curtains. So when you walk through this house, ask them, are there any curtains you're going to leave here or are you gonna be taking any of these curtains? Make sure it's clear. And here's why. Here in Missouri and Kansas, our seller's disclosure does not specifically ask, do the curtains stay? Do the curtain rods stay? But the contract will. The contract's going to build it in. So look at your documents because here's what can happen. It's uh, right before closing and your sellers take the curtains in the master bedroom and one of the little kids' rooms because they match the comforters. But in the contract itself, it might have built in automatically, pre-typed, the window coverings and complements stay with the property. It treats those as a fixture. But it was never on the seller's disclosure, and so now you have confusion, and your people, the sellers, took it. Um, and now you got a problem because now the buyers are moving in and they want to know where those curtains are. And they took the rods. What's wrong with these sellers? They stripped the house. So what could happen? Now you've got to make a horrible call to your client. Say, did you guys take the curtains? They're saying you guys took the curtains. Didn't you know you had to leave the curtains there? And they're going to say, you never told us we had to leave the curtains there. We were going to take them all along. So... This is where this comes in because sometimes the client does not fully read the contract, especially if they are e-signing it. They glance over it and they just start clicking. So you need to explain these things to your client because what can happen, you may end up having to pay the buyer some money to reimburse them for the curtains and the fancy curtain rods from Bed Bath & Beyond that your sellers took. 
unless you can get your sellers to bring them back, something like that. Another one I've been burned on before is it's moving day. On the seller's disclosure, my, my sellers, because it's my listing, they put on there, the washer and the dryer stay with the home. The seller is not going to take them. They're going to leave them there for the buyer. But the moving company is there, and they moved them into the moving truck, into a storage unit in another state. They're gone. That washer and dryer are not coming back. There's no way to get them back. And so now we have a problem. The buyer wants that washer and dryer. So your seller, now you've got the horrible call to make to your seller like, Gosh, guys, did you take the washer and dryer? You put on the disclosure, you're going to leave it there. And they say, well, you didn't remind us. We could have told the moving company to leave them there, but we totally forgot. So this is just aggravation and unneeded stress after closing. So my advice, remind your sellers if they're leaving the curtains there to leave them there. If they're leaving the washer and dryer, or say it's a microwave that's uh, sitting on the counter, it's personal property, but they put on the seller's disclosure, they're gonna leave it there. Well, make sure they leave it there. And I try to remind all of my sellers, right going up to closing, just make sure you guys remember, you're leaving the refrigerator, you're leaving the washer and dryer, do not take the curtains. <laughs> the curtains all stay there. And I mean, I stress this. I've been burned on this a couple times. And uh, chances are you as the realtor, you may have to end up shipping in to make this buyer happy in a, in a tough situation that whole thing could have been avoided. Thanks for checking out my video today. I hope this helps you pass your real estate exam. Please subscribe. Give my video a like, please. And go pass your real estate test.